I do want to springboard to another topic, though, and that's one that kind of grinds my gears a little bit more than anything, and that's queer theory. Because again, I have I have kids, and this in particular is what I deal with, uh, not just personally, but also because it's there in front of them. It's in the books. It's at the schools. It's online. It's almost cultish how it's become in that regard. Let's start with you, Neil. First, what is queer theory? And what does it have in common with CRT uh, when it comes to the postmodernism of how it functions? Because these seem, they're different. Uh, and, and queer theory, you write about this, you guys mentioned this, that it seems to be a little bit more, I want to say elusive, maybe that's the wrong word, but it seems more postmodernish. Uh, in that regard. So what are you what are your thoughts on that? This is a great illustration of why you shouldn't just conflate all of these theories because they have their mm -hmm. separate histories, separate origins, separate concerns. And now they have, as we show in the book, they've really come together and coalesced in the last even 10, 15 years under an intersectional framework. So today, if you pick up a, a modern text on the critical race theory, like uh, Kara Bridges, CRT, a primer, that book will have whole chapters on gender and sexuality. If you pick up a text on queer theory, it'll have a whole chapter on race. If you pick up a, cha a book on disability theory, you'll have chapters on things like post-colonialism. So, so it's under this intersectional grid, these are all related topics and you can't separate them. So that's why we're seeing these all coming sort of as a, as a, a amorphous mass that we call wokeism. But, but, but <laughs> historically, they did have separate origins. So where did queer theory come from? Uh, really, the, if the godfather of critical race theory was Derek Bell, the Harvard professor, uh, then the godfather of queer theory would be Michel Foucault, the mm -hmm. postmodern French philosopher. And now he did actually write about sexuality, and he was one of many French intellectuals in the 60s who campaigned, this is a wild, but they campaigned to abolish um, age of consent laws. So there would no longer be an age of consent. And that for a while, that was a cause celeb among French intellectuals, including Foucault. Uh, and, and he did write about sexuality. But mainly, he was concerned with how power works within society. And as you remember, that's a common theme among all critical theorists, whether it's critical race theory, uh, critical pedagogy, and queer theory. So they're both concerned with how power operates in subtle ways to, uh, to stratify society, to produce the oppressors and oppressed. Uh, but Foucault was, was much more deconstructive in his approach. He wanted to undermine uh, things like the very nature of truth, whereas CRT, these are legal theorists. They're not so much concerned with undermining what words mean, but, but, but Foucault was. Okay, so he's the godfather. Uh, I think Tessa de Laurentiis coined the term queer theory in 1991, I want to say. And uh, there are a number of major figures within the, you know, gender theory, gender studies, queer theory movement. The number one probably is Judith Butler, who is a, a currently uh, living uh, professor. I think she's at Berkeley right now. Um, but and, and so so what are the again central ideas of queer theory? The big one is a, a divorce between sex and gender, which actually goes back to the feminist, second wave feminists in the '60s. But they would say there's biological sex on the one hand. And then gender, which is a different, totally, totally separate category that is about how society treats you. So you have sex biology versus gender, a social category that we just, this bucket of male and female that is divorced from sex. But then number two, gender is not just a social category. It's an oppressive social category. So men are valorized as strong, independent leaders, competent, intelligent, rational, whereas women, according to queer theorists and feminists, women are, are, are conceptualized as weak, helpless, uh, maybe not very smart, emotional, hysterical, etc. So it's an oppressive category. Now, and then queer theory, and then queer theory goes farther and says, there's not just even just one category called gender, there's actually many categories. There, there's a sex, number one, and there's a spectrum. There's XX, you know, female, and there's XY, male, but then there's also intersex conditions where people, children are born with indeterminate biology. It's a spectrum. There's a spectrum of gender identity, how you feel. Do you feel like masculine or feminine or somewhere in the middle? There's a spectrum of sexual uh, gender expression. 
So how do you express your felt gender? You could dress in masculine ways. You could dress in feminine ways. You could dress in androgynous ways. And then there's a sexual orientation, again, a separate axis. You can be homosexual or heterosexual or bisexual or pansexual. And this is where you get actual figures like the gender unicorn that is being used as a teaching tool for kids, where they have a purple unicorn and they'll have in its head, they have uh, gender identity is a, how you think of yourself. You have sex, which is like your know, genitalia, what, you know, you know, masculine or feminine. You have your expression, how you act out your gender, and then you have your orientation and the heart, you know, what you, who you're attracted to. These are all completely separate categories. Whereas traditionally you have, you know, the male bucket and the female bucket, and the male bucket determines how you, uh, your biology and how you think about yourself how you express your gender and who you are supposed to marry and the female. And so traditionally in, in Christian worldview, you have just two categories is exclusive, all encompassing. It determines everything about how you see yourself. Whereas queer theory has now split those in almost an infinite number of categories. Uh, and there's a lot more there. I, I was close with this. And this probably is what is the real haymaker. I was told on Twitter and I'm sure it made you really upset, but it's there. Because queer theory is rooted in postmodernism, it wants to deconstruct not just gender as a category, but all categories and all norms. It wants to expose how these are all arbitrary. And that would include categories of age. So oh, there's right. So you saw the old. quotes. We quoted numerous right. texts, mm -hmm. very important texts in queer yep. theory, where queer mm -hmm. theorists themselves will say it outright that yes, there's an open debate within queer theory over the ethic, whether, whether it's ethical uh, or whether pedophilia is ethical. Uh, there's a, a line from Jagos where she says, can children, this is the actual quote, can children be sexualized in an ethical way? That's, that's an open question. Uh, mm -hmm. Should we call it pedophilia or intergenerational sex or man-boy mm -hmm. love? You know, those are, those are all very loaded terms. So she's asking, which of those should we use even to describe these, these affections and these orientations? So that, I know that you'll go on MSNBC and they will tell you that's scaremongering. That's just, you're just, you know, that's just bigotry. And we want to tell you it's not scaremongering. We can give you dozens of sources that will say outright, yes, this is debated. And I want, no, and it's not merely, why is it a slippery slope? No. Their project is the destabilization of all norms. If you can't decide what a man is anymore, you don't know what a woman is. If those are those categories are in, in contested, they're in flux. How then can you establish this firm, black and white, sharp division between adult and child? Mm -hmm. Once you cross this threshold, was it 18, 16, 17 and a half, 19? Well, how can you argue that we can't tell what a woman is, but we can tell what a child is? And, mm -hmm. and magically, you, when you're when you're seventeen point nine nine years old, you're a child. But when you're eighteen point zero one, then you're an adult. Now, that's their mm -hmm. right to say, "Hey, that's more arbitrary than male and female." And they want to say it's all arbitrary, which is it is inevitable conclusion of their own logic, which must, of course, just be rejected wholesale by Christians. Yeah, you know, it's funny because, oh man, so much to say on that. Um, <laughs> you see why it grinds my gears, right? Um, you know, it makes it very, it's very interesting because here we are with this gender identity crisis and you have minors you know, puberty blockers, gender affirming care. It's very interesting that you mentioned the terminology because, you know, you just change the terms and right. propaganda and all of a sudden it's all okay. And mm. uh, I think it would be very, that that seems obvious that that would be the next step is to go for age because that's the argument. Oh, but they're minors. You know, you need, you need parental consent to get a tattoo, but you can mm. go get hormone blockers. And it's very interesting that 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 naturally seems like the next step for them you know and it 20 years ago had you told these same people that are advocates for this today that they would be believing that gender was fluid they would have said you're you're fear-mongering and that's impossible and so it's 
I'm glad you mentioned the slippery slope. I actually wrote that down <laughs> to ask you about it. So you jumped right but on it's, that. Again, it's good. not a slippery slope. Slippery slope is when yeah. you're like, if you start, mm. you know, eating potato chips, next thing you know, you'll be an alcoholic drunk <laughs> using crack. Like, well, but why? Wait, what? Well, because they're both unhealthy. Well, there's no logical connection. But we're pointing yeah, out in yeah. the book, we showed there is an extremely logical yeah. connection. Right Another that. example would be, they talk about agency, freedom. Yeah. They, all these movements are liberatory, right? You want to give people agency. And we're like, amen, yes, agency. Well, what mm -hmm. about the freedom of children to choose their sexual partners? So well, that's different. Well, how? They actually have a category called adultism, like ableism, racism, mm -hmm. sexism. There's adultism. So when adults impose their values on children and say, mm -hmm. oh, but you're innocent, you're not sexual, you don't have the you don't have the agency to choose sexual partners, and they would say that's oppressive. You know, you have to give them the freedom to choose whether they want to be a. And they are sexual beings. It's there's some really, frankly, sick stuff in the literature, and we our publisher made us uh, censor a little bit of it. You can tell mm -hmm. what's there, but it is. Yeah. And then the last thing I'll just say, Melissa, yeah, there's yeah. a whole field called queer theology where professing Christians will apply these methods of queer theory, not just to you know biblical gender stuff, but just biblical theology. And they will question categories like good and evil and sin and redemption. And are these even stable categories? And they will say oh, outright, we're taking the methods of queer theory and of course, they're all affirming, but it's more than that. They're now going beyond just being LGBTQ affirming and saying, let's start asking. Oh, there's a quote. There's a quote where it says we should conceive of the Trinity as a divine orgy. Mm. It, it is just it is just perverted. Unreal. I'm sorry. Wow. Yeah. yeah, no, perverted is a very it's succinct a, way to Pat it, yeah. actually one night was reading up. To, we opened like 4 a.m. reading queer theory literature. And he called me the next day. He was just I just had forgotten that some of this stuff is just sick. Yeah. And it's yeah. true. He had to go to a Bible study to sort of cleanse his palate. But anyway, so. Yeah, I needed a shower afterwards. Yeah. Pat, that was a that was a whole thing. I probably yeah. talked to you guys about this for the whole time. But Pat, I want to know if uh, you have anything to add uh, on that topic. Yeah, I, I would mention that you mentioned the use of language and how language is yeah. power and the, the changing of language to soften things that historically have had mm -hmm. uh, perversion connected to it. We see the term minor attracted persons trying to mm -hmm. replace, uh, you know, words around pedophilia and pedastry and so forth. I do think it's important for us to recognize two things. Certainly there are people that are part of the LGBTQIA plus community that think that pedophilia should be outlawed and that it is a terrible thing, that it is grossly immoral. So we don't want to lose sight of the, the fact that there's people in the gay community that would say that pedophilia is a, is a terrible thing. In saying that, we also need to, to reinforce what Neil said, that pedophilia and the attack on age as something constructed today as being oppressive relative to giving power to adults and taking power mm -hmm. away from children, this is part mm -hmm. and parcel of the natural outworking of queer theory. This is not mm -hmm. something that we are laboring kind of layering on to the discipline to try to be provocative by no means. In fact, we're trying to underscore what I just said. There are people in the gay community that certainly think that a pedophile should go to prison. Uh, at the same time, queer theory does, in fact, make a strong attempt to destabilize all norms. And that will mean opening the door to trying to legitimize and legalize uh, sex between adults and non-adults and, and children. And this mm -hmm. is not scaremongering. It is part and parcel of the discipline. And so we want that balance, that we recognize that there are people in the gay community that obviously think this is evil and wrong, yet at the same time, queer theory does, in fact, uh, support what we're saying here. And it is logical based upon the rubric of critical theory. It is a natural mm -hmm. step. And then uh, nothing is left untouched or, or undisturbed. And as Neil mentioned, mm -hmm. even theology and Christian theology now will be contextualized in queer language, queer discourse, and queer ideas, and in very perverted ways, but it will be positioned as something that is a good <laughs> and mm -hmm. liberating and empowering yep. and 
it's it's quite disturbing.